Greetings travelers! Welcome back to Tales from the Enchanted Forest, where we bring you fairy tales, legends, myths, and folklore from around the world. We are your hosts, Fox and Sparrow. Hiya travelers! With the arrival of fall and soon to be winter, and because this episode was a little late due to life, we wanted to give you guys a treat with a longer episode that makes for a good fall listen. However, there are so many Persephone myths that explain the seasons, so we didn't want to go with the basic one, and we've already covered that before. So, we wanted to give you a story that has lots of mysterious old people, Mm -hmm. a flirty dragon mother, and a runaway mare. I bet you haven't heard a story like this before, and this Romanian story came as a pleasant surprise to us as well, because it was just weird. We recently covered some well-known fairy tales like the 12 Dancing Princesses and the Princess and the Pea. So let's dive into the unknown with this one. Yeah, we just, uh, we always try and shake it up what kind of, uh, what kind of stories we're covering week by week. And we really felt that it was time to come back to some of the lesser known ones, as it were. And this one is particularly good that Fox found and we're quite excited for it. And listen, I love a good Persephone story. It's one of my favorite tropes when I'm reading any young adult novels. You know, the girl that has to go underground and the guy who doesn't quite seem like he is. But I'm sure all of our avid Persephone fans will like this one. So without further ado, let's get into the story of The Flower Queen's Daughter. A young prince was out for a ride when he almost rode into a deep open ditch. As he came to a sudden stop, he heard a cry from below. To his astonishment, an old woman was trapped beneath, and being the good dude that he is, he set out to rescue her. Turns out it was as easy as hoisting her up. When she was safely on solid ground, the prince asked her how she fell into an obvious ditch. She replied that she had set off at midnight to sell her eggs in a nearby town, but had lost her way and fallen into it. Seeing as she was old and probably injured, the prince helped her onto his horse and took her back home. The old woman hadn't met many kind princes, so when they arrived at her house, she went inside to get something special for him. Upon her return, she looked at the prince carefully and exclaimed, Wouldn't you like to have the most beautiful woman in the world for your wife? Meeting a mysterious old woman who seems to know more than you think she does is kind of a classic fairy tale trope, so you can check that off your bingo card. But the thing that kind of blows my mind in this one is she says she hasn't met any nice princes before. But my question is, how many princes has she met where this is like what she's come to the conclusion of and like this is standing out to her? Like she had to have met several at this point, right? And why is this old lady meeting so many princes? What? What what life was she leading where this was common for her? Well, I feel like mysterious old women often meet the male heroes of these stories, whether they're princes or wounded soldiers or whomever. So I think that she's probably met tons of princes and helped them on their way. Yeah, I have nothing more. <laughs> I Yeah, it's just one of those things. I'm thinking things. of Baba Yaga, actually, when I think of old women. Are they generally nicer to men than women? Is that how this works? Um, well, I think I specifically am just thinking of Baba Yaga just because when I think of old women in fairy tales who are mysterious and help you with things, it tends to be her when we're talking about stock characters. But I think there are just random old women going around giving advice and helping princes with magical items often. If you listen to our 12 Dancing Princesses, an old woman just happens to be on the road and she happens to give this wounded soldier an invisibility cloak without Mm -hmm. a second thought. So I'm just going to say that old women are a trope or a character plot to just get things moving and to give the magic item without having to explain it too much. Yeah, I it's one of those tropes that I kind of enjoy, but I can't help but poke at it being like, but why? Well, every quest has, like, the old mentor character. Mentor is a very kind way to put it, because she doesn't really mentor him as much as, here's a thing, go for it. So after her question, the prince just laughs and agrees that he would, secretly hoping the old woman wasn't talking about herself. To his surprise, the old woman continued with a seriously weird story. She told him that the most beautiful woman in the world was the daughter of the Queen of the Flowers, and she had been captured by dragons. To marry her, he had to set her free first. 
Then the old woman produced a tiny bell from her pocket. If you ring this once, the king of the eagles will appear. If you ring it twice, the king of the foxes will come to see you. And if you ring it three times, then the king of the fishes will be at your side. These will surely help you on your journey. The old woman, who the prince was beginning to suspect was more than just a regular run-of-the-mill old woman, bid him luck and headed inside her house. When the prince went to follow, the house disappeared. The earth literally swallowed her house up. I really like this uh, magic item that he's been given. It's It sounds very interesting in the fact that it can summon three very powerful animal creatures, but also it's like ambiguous enough where it can kind of do anything, but also could be very unhelpful if they just decided not to help you for whatever reason. I kind of like the ambiguity of it. Yeah, because you don't know what they're going to do. Like, what purpose would you need the king of the fishes for? Right. It does also seem very area specific, I guess. Like, if you are doing a quest that leads you to an underground cave, I'm sure the fishes will come in very handy. But Mm -hmm. if you're somewhere else, I don't really see how that would be an easy thing to use. I'd also just be worried if if it summoned the king of the fishes, but the fish required water. And if I was on land, would it just kind of die in front of me? Like... I'd be too afraid to use it in the wrong spot, frankly. You're like, ah, never mind. I don't need you fishes. As princes in fairy tales tend to do, this prince threw himself wholeheartedly into his mission for a woman he had never met. He traveled the world for a year, and at this point, even his horse had died of exhaustion. (laughs) Instead of taking that as a cue to perhaps go home and settle for the second most beautiful woman in the world, the prince continued his quest, albeit he was very miserable. Finally, he came upon a hut where an old man was said to know the whereabouts of the dragons. However, that old man replied that, nope, he had no idea what the prince was talking about, and he had certainly never heard of dragons and flower queens. But he advised the prince to travel straight along the road for a year to where the man's father lived. Perhaps he could tell the prince about the dragons. So our weary prince followed the road for a year until he reached a very old man. This man also had no idea what the prince was talking about, but he guessed that if anyone would know something as wacky as this, it was his father, who, (laughs) you guessed it, lived a year away down the very same road. At this point, the prince had been traveling for over three years, so it would have been a sunk cost fallacy to stop now. He thanked the very old man and headed down the road for another year, until he came upon a very, very old man. You think you would have gotten another horse at this point to at least speed up the process like a little bit? But nope, it sounds like he's still just trekking on on foot. I don't really know what a measurement a year is. Like if someone said, oh, travel four months down this road and you'll get to where you need to be, I'd kind of be like, okay, but is it the same if I had to, like, you know, catch a ride with someone, a carriage, if I take a horse, if I walk? That's what the magical part of this story is. It doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense. Love it. Love it. Here for it. We have to really suspend belief here because there's no Google sat nav to tell us that this is not a good plan or a shortcut. I also will say I have no reason to think this, but in my head canon, the the old man is like the when he, when he says go to my, my father, it's actually the same dude just running like speed running down the way like dressing up and be like oh i don't know go talk to my other dad and then he like kind of (laughs) continues the kind of like from avatar the last airbender that one oh what episode is it the episode from that fish town um, yeah the one that's suffering due to the fire nation factory and all of their water is gross and they have the spirit lady the painted lady yeah that episode like for some reason i'm picturing that guy being this old man and just running down be like yep no reason to think so that's just me (laughs) i just want to know what kind of family problems they have that they all live a year away from each other (sighs) not even like i see my dad once a year it's just i live a year away from my father (laughs) i mean how much i want to be away from him i mean the story is probably supposed to be like a metaphor to be like you have to get older or something or like experience more of life or some nonsense like that but yeah the rule it's of threes we always yeah. have the rule of threes that's true but they all made sure they were living exactly one year apart and it's <laughs> like guys maybe we can come up with something a little better just a little bit 
I like it. I like the, I like, well, I mean, obviously it's the repetition of fairy tales. It has to be quite repetitive um, for oral storytelling. So that part makes sense to me. So the prince finally arrives and he's unsure if the very, very old man was even alive. The prince approached the ancient looking figure on the porch cautiously. Feeling a little bit foolish, he spoke out loud and declared the man's son and grandson had sent him. After what felt like forever, during which time the prince questioned all of his life choices, the man spoke. The dragon lives up there on the mountain, and he has just begun his year of sleep. If you wish to see his prisoner, the flower maiden's daughter, then you must go to the second mountain, where the dragon's mother holds a ball every night. The prince tried asking more questions, but it seemed like the man was done answering, and so the prince thanked him and went on his way to climb the second mountain. Hopefully, it would not take him a year to climb, and he secretly hoped he would not meet any more mysterious old people along the way. Old people. Helpful, but annoying. (laughs) (laughs) Sending you on life-altering missions with very little information. (laughs) That's what it feels like when I talk to my grandma. She's like, can you please go pick this up from the store? It's like, I don't know what this item is. I don't know if if they make it anymore, grandma, but here I go. (laughs) But I also think the idea that he has to go to not just an old man, but someone who's almost ancient, I think it kind of relates to the fact that this information and these dragons and the flower maiden, that they belong to a a more ancient tradition where normal, like not normal people, but like the current age doesn't know about them. So you have to go to someone who holds the key to that knowledge. And that's kind of what old people do represent in some of these stories is that they are the kind of guardians of information that the rest of the world doesn't have because they're the last ones to remember it so you have to like seek it out you can't just know it because it's not something that's just around like you can't look at the like the newspaper or something you have to go seek it in not just someone who's who remembers it but someone who remembers it and can share it with you because they're still alive just something i thought of because we were talking about why he had to go see the son the father and the grandfather When the prince reached the top of the second mountain, he was startled to see that a castle made of gold with diamond windows rested at the top. He had been expecting a cave with hoarded treasures, or maybe even a grisly tower with dragons and flames around it, but he was quite pleasantly surprised by this. Without much of a plan, the prince opened the gates and wandered in. He was immediately confronted by seven dragons who demanded to know what he wanted. Thinking quickly and hoping that there was no dragon father, the prince replied that he was there to see the great dragon's mother. He had traveled far and wide after hearing of her great beauty and kindness. The dragon guards were hesitant but flattered nonetheless and led him down twelve splendid halls to the great dragon mother. She was the ugliest woman under the sun with three grotesque heads. When she opened her mouth to ask him why he had come, her voice was like the croaking of ravens. The prince quickly masked his disgusted shock for astonishment and begged the queen to enter her service. The queen was flattered and fanned her three heads as she thought over his request. He was a very handsome prince after all. So she agreed, but she wanted the measure of the man first. As a test, he would have to lead her mare out every morning and bring her back every night for three days. If he failed, then they would eat him up. It was a win-win for the queen. Secretly wondering why a dragon would need a horse, the prince agreed and went to bring the skittish mare out to the meadow. However, as soon as they reached the grass, the horse vanished. The prince was, quite frankly, over this. However, he did not spend three years and the death of his own horse in order to fail now. As he cursed the old woman in the ditch, he suddenly remembered the little bell she had given him. Taking it out, he rang it once. There was a rushing noise next to him and a mighty eagle landed. The feathers along its head gleamed like a crown, and the eagle spoke before the prince could ask for his help. I know what you want from me. The dragon's mare is galloping freely in the clouds. I will gather all of my kind and steer her back to you. The prince didn't even have time to say thank you or ask a question like, did the eagles consider themselves a deus ex machina mechanism by saving Gandalf and later Frodo and Sam? Before he knew it, a flock of what looked like thousands of eagles were flying towards him and at their helm was a startled mare. Before he knew it, a flock of what looked like thousands of eagles were flying towards him, and at their helm was the startled mare. He grabbed hold of her and reined her in as the eagles flew away. 
He would never have his Middle Earth questions answered, but at least he wouldn't be eaten by the dragon tonight. Well, the prince might not be able to ask those questions and get the answers. I have a little bit more knowledge on the eagles from The Lord of the Rings. So, in the books, the eagles are actually given much more explanation and foreshadowing than we see in the movie. So, while you could still argue they're a bit of a deus ex machina in the book, at least there's, like, you do know about them ahead of time, and, like, there is some reason to think that they could show up. And while I've not read the entirety of the trilogy... I do clearly remember them being uh, talked about, and I think there was even conversations with them early on in the Fellowship of the Ring. And there's also a scene in The Hobbit where Bilbo meets them, and their lores expand further there of why they're there and why they sometimes help and why they don't always help uh, kind of their culture and everything. It's very interesting. Uh, But unfortunately, their screen time was cut short in both the Hobbit trilogy and the Lord of the Rings trilogy because those movies are already very long. Um, so yeah, just in case you were wondering, the movies might have shown that, but there's more in the books. So while we have Tolkien's letters and the books to go off of, our poor prince will never have his answer. (gasps) Poor dude. There's no one to um actually him. (laughs) When he returned the mare that night, the dragon queen was delighted and gave him a cloak of copper to wear to her ball that night. There, amongst the other dragons, was the loveliest maiden the prince had ever seen. She wore a dress made of flowers, and her face was like that of lilies and roses. The prince risked dancing with her, and whispered between twirls that he was there to rescue her. The princess replied that if he lived till the third day, he should ask the dragon for a foal of the mare. They danced until the ball came to a close at midnight, when the flower maiden was whisked back to her room. With more gusto, now that he had actually seen the fabled flower maiden, and could confirm that this was all worth it, The prince took the mare out the next day. Again, she disappeared and the prince rang the bell two times. This time, a sleek king of foxes came bounding next to the prince. This time, all the foxes in the world came together to find the mare and return her to the mountainside. This time, the dragon mother gave him a cloak of silver and danced with him at the ball. When he could risk sneaking away, the prince danced with the flower maiden and she whispered for him to wait for her in the field with the foal after the next ball. The dance ended at midnight, and the next day the prince took the runaway mare with him to the field. This time when it escaped, he rang the bell three times, and the king of the fishes appeared in the nearby river. This time when it escaped, he rang the bell three times, and the king of the fishes appeared in the nearby waters. The king said they would return the mare who had hidden herself in the rivers. That night, the dragon mother was overjoyed to see the prince alive. She had grown fond of the idea that he came all this way and worked hard to please her. In fact, the dragon mother had grown quite lonely in her palace and was looking for someone to help water her gardens. She gave him a gold cloak to wear to the ball, but asked him what else he wanted. After all, he was her new body servant and lover. The prince was grossed out, but he begged for the foal of the queen's mare. The queen obliged, and they went to the ball together that night. With the queen's full attention on him, the prince only managed to slip away close to midnight. He had not risked looking for the flower maiden, and so he had no idea what her plan was when he mounted the foal and rode him to the mountainside. Towards midnight, the maiden rushed out of the palace and the two rode like the wind towards the flower queen's dwelling. When the dragon mother went to retire with her new lover, she noticed he had gone missing and became furious at his deception. The dragon woke her son, and he raged at the loss of the flower maiden and the skeevy prince that duped his mother. He left to chase them, planning on laying siege to the flower queen's dwelling. But the prince and the maiden had a head start, and they reached the flower queen's palace just in time. The queen created a forest of flowers as high as the sky to cover her palace. And also, sidebar, we are going to add that these are either fireproof flowers or the dragon was not of the fire-breathing variety. Otherwise, this would be a terrible plan. (laughs) Anyway, the Flower Queen's plan worked and the dragon went back to his lair. The Flower Queen herself was quite pleased to have her daughter back, but relented that she could not keep her by her side forever. So she consented to their marriage, but only if her daughter was returned to her every winter when everything above ground was dead. The young couple accepted these terms, and finally, after nearly three years, the prince returned home with his beautiful bride. They lived happily until winter came, and the maiden left to live in her mother's underground palace. 
Despite this constant coming and going with the seasons, the two lived happily ever after. And that is the Romanian story of the Flower Queen's Daughter. Woot! I like this. I love a good seasons explanation story. They always seem really good, um, really fun. But yeah, I just, I don't understand why, like, they couldn't just, like, move in with the queen if she was like, I need to see you at least half the year. It's like, well, can't we just, like, be a neighbor, live nearby, and don't have to, like, move every six months? Hey, hey. <laughs> Well, it's probably because the king, well, the prince will eventually be the king and he has to live in his kingdom. And she's probably some kind of lower goddess in this case. Um, And she has to also be with her people and her mother. If we're going based off the Persephone story, I mean, if she's in Hades' underground, underworld realm, I doubt that that would be a place that other people would want to be. Um, But... What I do like about this story is that it is so full of different tropes and motifs and ideas. We have the copper, silver, and gold cloaks. We have the doing a task three times. We have the bell. We have different animal helpers coming to your aid. We have the, you know, the princess at midnight. Yeah, and we have old people. It's great. I... I love it. <laughs> um, Mystical old people, dragons, flower maidens, queens. I think it has pretty much everything you could ask for. They even have one of my favorite, which is like when you have villains that have like are a family of villains, when they can see them bicker with each other, like the mom and the son <laughs> being like, what the heck? We've been duped. Let's get out of here. Like, I don't know. To me, it's just always fun. I see it as like a slapstick comedy team that they would be trying to go rush out to get them, but they would just never be able to quite do it properly. I just don't know how she explained to her son that, you know, this guy appeared three days ago and he took her mare out and also was, you know, she made him her lover, but then she dis- he disappeared with the flower maiden. It's just, it's very bizarre, which I like because it's quite an intricate story. And I know a lot of the time stories tend to be, very singular in their quest plot line Mm -hmm. and so you have one of these things or you have a very kind of obvious ending to it but with this one everything that happened was different i mean the mayor ended up being a magical mayor as well that could apparently fly and swim so i feel like every element in this was just so perfectly whimsical that it felt like you were in a completely different world which i really enjoyed yeah, it just had so many different elements, and it was kind of, as far as fairy tales go, quite meaty. Um, there's a lot to dig mm-hmm. into here. It kind of reminds me of um, East of the Sun, West of the Moon. Yeah, where it was just so much going on. You think you see where it's going, and then it's like, and then there's Act 2, and let's investigate that. I really enjoyed it. Um, I also like how he had that bell for three years and forgot about it. It's like, here's a magic item. Have fun. What? You forgot about it? <laughs> but imagine he had used it to like, get to the next place quicker. That would have been a waste. Well, we don't know for sure if it was a one-use magic item. Like, it, she didn't say anything about that. It could have been summoning them multiple times or regenerating on a long rest. You don't know. <laughs> <laughs> we were trying to add D&D rules to this magical story. <laughs> yes, always. <laughs> I think I hear a bell ringing in the distance which means we're going to have to get going. But before we do that, let's go over to our five fantastic finds. Number one. One of the big staples in fairy tales is that the main female character must be very beautiful. But this story takes it one step further and declares the Flower Queen's daughter is the most beautiful woman in the world. It's never clear if the old lady just decided this, or if she heard this from someone else, or if there was a beauty contest held to determine if she was truly the world's most beautiful woman. Because of the obvious nitpicks of how a person can become the most beautiful woman in the world, this title and trope usually only occurs in fairy tales where these types of things are a little more accepted. This is also not the first time we have covered a story with this trope on the podcast. Kaguya, from the Japanese tale of the bamboo cutter, is also described as the most beautiful woman in the world. This was in part because she was not of this world. She was actually from the moon, which did explain her more out-of-this-world beauty. Kaguya 
and the Flower Queen's daughter are both related to semi-divine beings, but this kind of connection is not mandatory for someone to qualify for the title of the world's most beautiful woman. But if they don't have this familial connection, the divine might bless or interfere with the world's most beautiful woman anyways. This leads us to Helen of Troy from the Grecian mythology. The Trojan War began from a dispute of who was the most beautiful goddess, Hera, Athena, or Aphrodite. This was simply a no-win situation, as there was no way these goddesses would take losing this contest lightly. They entrusted this decision to a shepherd named Paris, and naturally each of them bribed him for the title. Hera offers him power to be the king of the world. Athena offers him wisdom and glory in battle. And Aphrodite offers the most beautiful woman in the world, Helen, to fall in love with him and become his wife. Paris chooses Aphrodite and sails off to marry Helen. This not only angered Hera and Athena, but also Menelaus, king of Sparta and Helen's husband. He would later go on to rally all the kings to go to war with Paris of Troy, and thus beginning the Trojan War. Number two. It's rare to find a living or kind mother in a fairy tale. Now, we've covered this trope before when talking about stories like Donkey Skin or Beauty and Pockface, and usually moms end up either dead at the beginning of a story or they're never mentioned. Stepmothers, on the other hand, are often depicted as evil in order to deal with kind of our society's deep anxieties over portraying direct maternal figures as anything but pure and goodly. So basically, moms get to die so that we don't tarnish them, and stepmothers are free game for the evil roles. But what about the mother of monsters? Of course, we have Grendel's mother from Beowulf, and we talk about her quite extensively in an episode we did on a couple literature heroes. Um, but what about myths and legends and fairy tales? Basically, who's the mother of all the monsters our princesses and princess fight? Now, You'd be surprised because there are quite a bit of them and they're all over mythology and religion. In some texts, Lilith is considered the first wife of Adam and after leaving him, she becomes the mother of these different monstrous creatures. There's also the Mesopotamian Tiamat and she is seen as either the crater goddess or one of primordial chaos, just like the Grecian Gaia. Now, a lot of people don't really know this, but most of the Grecian monsters, they come from Gaia as well. So not just um, the gods and the titans, but she and Uranus are kind of the mother and father of all of the creatures. And so in some of the myths, you see that the heroes have to be kind of careful about killing specific monsters because they're still Gaia's children. Now, if we are fully turning over to Greek mythology, we can see lots of mothers of monsters. One of the big ones is Echidna for Cerberus, who guards Hades' land of the underworld. Uh, we have the Hydra, the Chimera, the Sphinx, and even the Nemean Lion. If we turn focus over to Norse myths, we have the giantess who ended up with a bunch of children with Loki, who is, you know, the trickster god and often in these kind of weird situations. So giantess is called Angerboda, and she has three kids with Loki. So they are Hel, Fenrir, and I always mispronounce this, but this is the world serpent Jorgmungandr. Um, and she is also known to have wolf cubs, and I don't know if that's a myth or if that's just something to make her seem more scary, but that is one of the most common things that's associated with her, is her children with Loki. These mother of monsters have obviously inspired many works today, with the most famous being H.P. Lovecraft's Shub Nigaroth and Grendel's mother from Beowulf, as we mentioned before. If you can think of any more, I would love to hear about them, because I think it's so interesting to have other mothers or maternal figures be introduced in stories, just like the Dragon Queen from this one. Number three. Big fancy balls are a common occurrence in fairy tales and fantasy stories. They are big events where nobles socialize in dazzling ball gowns and dance the night away. And many romantic leads meet at such events, only to seek each other out soon after. Balls are also a great way for characters to enter new social spheres, since there are a lot of comings and goings at these events. Sometimes invitations are required to gain entry, but in fairy tales, characters often just need to be beautiful and dressed for the occasion. In our story, the dragon mother had a ball every single night which would not only just be exhausting to prepare and attend, 
but also cues the audience to the indulgent lifestyle she leads. After all, balls like these were very expensive, so they usually only occurred when there was something to celebrate. But big events like a ball can also be used for more sinister intentions. In the opening scenes of the movie Anastasia, the villain Rasputin stages a revolt against the royal family and vows to destroy them. Choosing to do this during a ball ensured that the whole royal family and their supporters would be in one place at that moment, which made it easy for him to wipe them out in one fell swoop. Well, almost the entire family. Of course, our protagonist Anastasia manages to escape, but she relives the memories of that ball at a later point in the film. Number four. So this story is obviously a reference to the cycle of seasons as used in the Persephone myth from Greek mythology, but did you know that Persephone was also linked to a dragon story? And disclaimer here, if you haven't heard the story of Persephone or if you're interested in that, we do have an in-depth episode about that with PhD scholar Jessica Caravaggio, and we go over kind of the story, we go over its sources, we go over the um, traditions from Ovid as well as from other traditions where we see Persephone and kind of the idea of the maiden, the mother, and the crone. So definitely go check that out, but I want to talk about the dragons here. So in most traditions, Persephone is the daughter of Demeter, the goddess of the harvest, and Zeus, the king of the gods. And when she is in her maidenhood, she tends to capture the eye of literally every Olympian and grossly enough, including her own father. When her mother sees everyone's kind of impure attention to her daughter, she turns to the god of prophecy who warns her of a robber bridegroom and someone who will besmirch her before marriage. So Demeter is quite determined to prevent this fate. And so she uses a dragon carriage to carry Persephone into a grotto and hide her into a cave with two dragons standing guard. However, Zeus ends up finding the location of Persephone's hiding place, and he disguises himself as a dragon in order to get in and form a union with her. From that union came Zagreus Dionysus, and Zeus immediately places the baby upon the throne of heaven with tiny lightning bolts. Of course, his actual wife, Hera, would not let this stand, and she spurs the jealousy of the titans to trick the young boy into coming down off of his throne and playing with them, and when he does, they dismember him. Um, Zeus does end up taking Zagreus' heart and makes it into a potion for his next human lover, Semele, and she ends up giving birth to the second Dionysus, which is why sometimes you might hear Dionysus the god being called the second or being referred to as having two mothers, And that's just because the potion that Zeus gave his mother makes it so that he has a connection to Persephone as well. Now, there is one reference I did find in the Dionysica of Nonus, and he writes about how Hera manages to manipulate Persephone into sending an Arenus to plague Dionysus with madness by telling her that Zeus saved his other children, so his other human children, his other demigod children, but he did not save hers. He also gave Semele a place in the heavens, but managed to send Persephone down to the gloom of the underworld as Hades' bride. He also gave Semele a place in the heavens, but sent Persephone down to the gloom of the underworld as the wife of Hades, his brother. And I'm going to quote this bit because I think it's best said in the author's own words. And here he is speaking as Hera, What good was it that he put on the deceiving shape of a serpent and ravished the girdle of your inviolate maidenhood if after bed he was to destroy your babe? Of course, all of these notes will be on our website so you can take a look at some of the links and of the sources yourself. And number five. A while ago, I was playing a new video game. After about 10 hours of gameplay, I realized I wasn't really enjoying it but I had already purchased the game and put so much time into it, it just felt like I had to finish the game anyways. Similar to the prince traveling three years on nothing but a rumor, I found myself in a sunk cost fallacy. We both had put so much effort into something, even though it was showing no signs of a positive return. And because we put so much into these endeavors, we felt compelled to invest further until we felt it had paid off. 
Thankfully for the prince, this would ultimately show dividends. Well, I have simply lost too many hours to a disappointing game. So why does this happen? Well, it's because humans are not as rational as we like to believe. Instead of focusing on the present situation and future costs to determine what decisions will bring the best outcome, we focus on previous investments' irrecoverable costs to dictate a decision, even if that decision is not in our best interest. It's hard to come to terms with the fact that the time and resources previously poured into an endeavor cannot be recovered. As a result, we focus on our previous loss instead of focusing on future gains. The term for this cognitive bias was first coined in 1972, and over the years, more and more people have studied this phenomenon and why we are so susceptible to it. While the sunk cost fallacy is largely looked at through an economic lens, it also applies to our daily lives and relationships. It's easy to get trapped in this way of thinking, but it is important to recognize when it's time to stop trying to prevent a past loss and start looking for a future gain. As always, if you want to see the show summary, then subscribe for updates on our website at talesfromenchantforest.com. And if you want to hear more from us, join us on Twitter at From Enchanted or on Instagram, Mastodon, or TikTok by our podcast name. For questions, comments, and guest requests, please send us an email to talesfromenchantforest at gmail.com. And if you have anything to share, then please don't hesitate. Remember, travelers, if you enjoyed what you heard today and what we do here, then please give us a review on whatever platform you use to listen to this podcast. It helps the podcast grow and reach new travelers to join us on these adventures. And remember, there's always a place for you in the Enchanted Forest. Thank you.